Good evening and welcome to Redeem 2020 Ministries Friday Night Bible Study. I'm Jason Drake. The book of Philippians is really full of the things that the Apostle Paul wanted to tell those believers, Christians, who were in the church in the city of Philippi. If you haven't picked up the previous studies we've done a couple of weeks now, go to our website, redeem2020ministries.org, and look at the top under Bible study. You'll find there video recordings so you can get caught up. Now, grab your Bible, a notebook, a pen so you can take notes, and let's get into it. Once again tonight, once again, we are going to continue our study in Philippians. I kind of like this idea of going through a book of the Bible. There's a great advantage to settling into the understanding of listening to a writer, listening to the Apostle Paul, who wrote so many of the books of the New Testament. And Philippians is one that is very practical, but it's also one where Paul was not trying to address a specific problem. He did write other books to churches that were demonstrating problems or having problems in their their understanding, their, their teaching about Jesus, their relationships with one another, all those things were characterized, I would call them as problems, and he would write uh, to these churches, and the letters, the books of the Bible, seem to be characterized by that kind of, of tone. But in this one, Philippians, he's not. He's writing as a way of saying thank you. The people of the church in Philippi had sent supplies to him in Rome. Paul was writing from Rome. Now, let me please refresh your memory about the background. I love to start off uh, thinking more about the background of this book, why it was written and who it was written to and what was the occasion and all those things, because that helps us understand more about what Paul was writing. Why did he say things the way he did? Now, the people in the church of Philippi had sent a person we're going to learn more about him next time, uh, probably two weeks from now when we read. No, it'll probably be next week. This young man, Epaphroditus, had come from the church of Philippi all the way to Rome. It was a quite a long trip for anybody in those days. From He was in the part of Greece, and he went over to Rome, and he was carrying these things, these uh, supplies and gifts for the Apostle Paul. And Epaphroditus, while he was there, he got sick. And so Paul waited until he was recovered and sent the letter that we're reading back to Philippi with him, hand-carried, to go back to the people. So you can tell in this letter that Paul is writing, and we'll we'll learn next week some more about the occasion of the of the writer. I'm I'm sorry of the of the messenger. But let me uh, share again my screen so that we can get some orientation. We're starting off with the background like we have done each week. And so here is the map that shows Paul's travels. Whoops, I'm going to try and extend this down, drag this down a little bit here so we can see. All right. So Paul started off in Jerusalem. There it is where the arrow is located, and you can see the blue Mediterranean Ocean, and he traveled all the way up here to this place called Philippi in, on one of his journeys. All that time and distance, Paul was talking and preaching and helping to plant churches. That was one of his main goals there was to plant churches. He did so, of course, in Philippi, and the people there were faithfully following Jesus. Here's a closer view of the city of Philippi. I've got it pointed, the arrow pointed there. Where it says Macedonia up here, that is actually what is modern-day Greece, and the city of Athens, which is the capital of Greece, is down here. Paul did go there to speak, uh, I want you to know that this region of the world, of course, is extremely uh, known for the intellectual people who had written so much. The language of the day, in fact, among the people in the Palestine area, the Middle East, was Greek. And so the Bible was originally written in Greek, the New Testament. Thank you. I need to clarify that. New Testament was written in Greek because the Greek language and culture were so dominant. Now, the 
the nation of Greece there was made up of these different city-states. And just for your information, right about there where the arrow is pointing is where my grandmother is from. My grandmother came to the United States from Greece in uh, about 1914. My grandfather, whom she married, was already here near the city of Boston. My grandmother was a young 14-year-old woman who lived in a tiny village up in the mountains about the area where I'm pointing to now. It was a very rural village, and um, she was able to go to America and wanted to go to America, and like many of the people of that time, because someone in her village had a passport to go and got sick and was unable to travel, period. And so for some reason, the friendship, the relationship, my mother may, our grandmother may have looked like her. My grandmother by the name was Athena, if that's not a Greek name. Athena took the passport of her friend and she traveled to America. She went to live near the city of Boston, actually in the city of Lowell, Massachusetts. And there she was, a, it was an arranged marriage with my grandfather, my grandfather, Andrew. And the two of them both came through Ellis Island, which is the entry port, of course, in New York City. And there are records that we've been able to look up as to what ship they were on by name. They've kept records of all those people. All right, I diverted a bit for a little personal history, but that's the nation, the island of Greece. Now, if we go back to this one, you'll see down here, eventually Paul ended up in Rome. I'm pointing to it there on that little tiny map. Let me see if I can get that a little bit larger. Yeah, that's better. Let's get it up a little bit, a little bigger. So you can see Paul eventually got to Rome and he was there under house arrest in Rome, Italy. So he was writing letters to the churches from there. Uh, house arrest means that he had freedom of, of uh, you know, of, of somewhat of, of movement. But in short, uh, it was a few years there. And then later, of course, the emperor Nero uh, had him killed, assassinated, had his head chopped off, I believe is the legend uh, that's told to us, approximately 66 AD, the year 66 AD. Now, why is that important? Well, we know that our Bible is comprised of books written by 40 authors over a period of 1,500 years. But our Bible comes under attack today, whether or not it's authentic, whether or not it was written by people, whether or not it was, uh, we really know what the people wrote then and so forth. Uh, there are a lot of critics who will try to denounce the person of Jesus, even his existence, whether or not he was a legend or a myth. But we know for sure because unlike historical documents of that time, and we're talking about the Roman Empire, which was, of course, uh, very much a, a, an empire of study or of, of, of intellect, and the Greeks were people of intellect, there are very, very few copies of any of these ancient documents. The New Testament, however, we have existing today 25 thousand copies of the writings of the New Testament. Let me say that again. We're not basing our faith on just somebody who wrote a thousand years later who decided they wanted to shape a religion around this myth. We've got copies of what Paul wrote, and the copies that were written were written by people who were copying them for others, and the copies that were written are all copies they say are dated less than 100 years from when Paul's original handwritten letter was written. Now, we don't have a copy of Paul's handwritten letter, but we have, again, people who quote, this is what Paul's letters said, and they made 25,000 copies of all these books of the New Testament. And they distributed them among the churches because the churches wanted to know and have a record and have these writings and study them because they knew who the apostles were and they trusted and believed that God's Spirit was working through these apostles to provide God's Word. So that makes the book of Philippians one of these books that we can be sure of. Paul's name is in it. Paul attests to the fact that he wrote it. And we know from the, again, historical records that took place within 100 years. Now think about what happened 100 years ago in the United States. 
we are a, a nation of records. They too, the Jewish people, were a nation of keeping detailed records, especially through the system of the synagogues and the temple that were uh, existent at that time. It was in a little bit later that the temple in Jerusalem was destroyed by the Romans, but still there were vast records kept by these scribes, these men who were trained to copy over in, in detailed uh, accuracy with ceremonial procedures. All those things are sure are assurance assurance to us that the books of the Old Testament were still being copied by these scribes in the first century, the first hundred or a few or even hundreds of years following the life of Jesus even. And when Jesus was alive, he would have been able to see in his synagogue copies of the Old Testament scrolls. And so we can be certain that we know what the original writers were saying. Not only that, but we can know from history and the history that was recorded in those first few hundred years that Paul lived when he lived and when he wrote and the accuracy of the details even from non-biblical Christians non-Christian sources. So all of these are, are assuring us. Now, let's go back to, again, Paul in his house arrest, and he's writing these letters, and he has some people with him, including the apostle Timothy. I'm sorry, I use the term apostle. We don't call him that, but Timothy was Paul's, uh, Paul's assistant and Paul's apprentice. Timothy was there with him. So if you were to open your Bible again, to the book of Philippians and go back and look. I didn't point this out when we first started, but Paul begins his greeting to these people by saying in the first verse, Paul and Timothy to all the saints who are in Philippi. So we know Timothy was with him. We also know that there are others that traveled with him and that were able to be with him there in Rome and visit him in his house arrest while he was awaiting trial. Now let's go back and look some again at the things that we do when we're doing Bible study. I want to return to my screen. Let's see. Because each week I'm trying to also help you to understand how to do Bible study and how to do a book study, which is different maybe than studying uh, the gospel stories of Jesus. And now we're studying this book of Philippians. So the first thing we've talked about today is background, and we always continue to do background study and look at what other writers today have done to study the background of this book. Then we look at the context. I've talked to you about that today some, where Paul, why he was writing, he was not trying to discuss some kind of particular problem, but just expressing his thanks for the gift that they sent, his joy, which we'll see that word repeated many times, his joy at thinking about their faith and hearing stories about their faith. He would have heard these stories. Why? How? Wh what? Through what means? The guy Epaphroditus came to visit, would have told him these stories about what was going on. Then we do an outline. I've done an outline of the book uh, so far. And so while I'm going to share that with you, that's, that's just a map. It's just a step-by-step -step way of seeing what was Paul saying and what are the important points in here and then we want to use cross-references, ways in which we see other things that Paul wrote or things that Paul may have referred to. I mentioned to you last week or the week before, there are no references in the book of Philippians that quote Old Testament passages. That seems awkward. It seems a little odd. Paul did that a lot in his writings, but not in the book of Philippians. Okay? I think it was probable because uh, be, because. When Paul was quoting Old Testament passages, he was trying to establish a, an authoritative voice for speaking to them about what God had determined was right and wrong when he was addressing problems. All right, so we use cross-references. Next, we use questions. And I like to do that every time I'm doing a study, asking questions. What, where, why, how? Those are simple ones but also questions when I come across verses I don't understand, words I don't understand, or a reference Paul may have made that I don't understand. Finally, we want to look at how does it apply to my life? That certainly is the most important. I don't want to just fill your head with knowledge tonight. I don't want to just spend time 
talking about facts, I want to talk about how we can apply these things to us, to our lives. That's the most important part of what God wants us to do when we do Bible study. All right, let's go back. Let's uh, let's look first at what we discussed in the book of uh, the first chapter of Philippians, and we picked out some key verses. That's another part of doing a Bible study on a book. What are the key verses in each chapter, and how does that key verse represent the thoughts that were being presented? And we came up with Philippians one six. Uh, I certainly suggested this was the the one that I thought was most important, where he is beginning in his greeting to say, and I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. We're talk, we've talked. we talked before about what he was meaning when he talked about what is the day of Jesus Christ when, when you and I, all of us, will stand before Jesus. He's saying God's going to keep working in you. God is at work in you. God is using the events of your life, the, the, the physical health challenges, the challenges and struggles in relationships, the, the struggle over your your finances, your job, the events that are taking place, even the events that take place among the nations right now <clears throat> that may affect you and I. God is at work in your life and he knows what you need and what is best. So he is, according to Paul, going to continue his work. The second part of that chapter, we took Paul's statement, for me to live is Christ. And to die is gain. And we talked about how he said, I am crucified with Christ, but nevertheless, it's not I that live, it's Christ living in me. Then he made the statement to die is gain. Paul had assurance of his eternity with the Lord Jesus Christ, like you and I can have that assurance. We can know that we, even now, we can know that we are going to experience that we have been given the gift of eternal life. The Apostle John wrote in 1 John 5, 13, these things have I written to you that you may know that you have eternal life. It wasn't that you may hope or wish, or maybe if you do a little bit more, or maybe if just before you die, you do something spiritual or religious. No. The Apostle John wrote, this is the record that God has given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He who hath the Son hath life, and he that does not have the Son of God does not have life. And then John was emphatically putting a big, huge exclamation point when he said, these things I have written unto you that you may know that you have eternal life. John was certain of that, and he was writing to believers, and he wanted them to be certain of that. Okay, now here we are, ready to jump into second chapter. Philippians 2. I'll ask somebody to do as we've done each week. Please go ahead and read. We've got about three screens of Philippians 2. If you're following along in your by own Bible, your own translation, we're going to start with verse 1 and go through 11. So someone read for me, please, if you start. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my... Complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord, and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing that to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every, every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the God, the Father. Okay, good. Thank you. So here we have Paul now trying to 
give them a bit of instruction. And so I'll go right back to the first verse in the chapter two. By the way, please remember, chapters and verses are things that have been added later to the scriptures that we now have, excuse me, and, and translated. The original authors did not write in those forms, and they didn't write little numbers next to the verses. But here we have a change of subject matter so that it seems this is the, a, 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 a shift. Paul has been talking about, the last things he talked about was for me to live as Christ and to die is gain. And then he says, therefore, actually, this translation starts off with so, but in some of the others, it, the first word in the verse is therefore. Whenever you see the word appear, therefore, at the beginning of a statement or a chapter or a verse, you need to ask yourself the question, what is it there for? What is he referring to? Well, he says, look, since I have a great deal of, of joy and purpose in continuing to live rather than die, to be a, an influence and a positive impact on you and the rest of those who want to, to live and know Jesus Christ, he says so. Therefore, if there's any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the spirit, any affection and sympathy. So he's 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 sort of like listing these motivations for what he's about to say. If you're motivated by these things, from from your love for one another, from God's spirit influencing you, from sympathy, just just sympathy, maybe. It, he says, I would get a great deal of joy. It would really make me feel joyful if you would, and then he goes on. That's kind of the way he's presenting this spiritual challenge to them, this set of instructions to them. Uh, I, I want you to be really motivated to think about and do what it is I'm instructing you to do. So here's the instruction. It starts by saying, being of the same mind. Having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Now, I want to jump in around here and look at some of these key words because they will tell us something that obviously means something important to Paul. What key words stick out to you in just those, that first sentence that I read? Tell me in your thoughts. Put on your mic if you would. Just blast out of here. What are some of the key words you see in that that little first sentence? I see uh, um, to not be selfish and to be humble. Okay, you're going a little further than I was. I'm trying to just oh. kind of pick out this first the first verse, a uh, first uh, sentence there. Kind of go pick out from the first sentence. What do you see in there? Well, I see. Uh, I, I, he's uh, he's kind of showing um, that in order to to show love and affection and sympathy, that like that's what he's uh, pointing at. Yeah. Okay. You know, one of the things I noticed was in this translation, the word mind was repeated mm -hmm. and it, it's, uh, i'm afraid i'm going to try and get to the, the yeah let's get some background noise out of there thank you okay so, so the encouragement in christ so paul there's anthony good to see you man uh so what paul is saying here is i'm asking all of you to have the same mind the same kind of unity of thought here unity of purpose I'm asking you, it will give me great joy if I know that you all have the same love for one another, the same kind of mind, the same kind of unified way of thinking. I want you to sort of set that key word aside for a moment because it's going to be important to what, uh, to what we're discussing and studying tonight. And that is, how can I be single-minded 
And how can I with other believers be together unified in our single mindedness? Yeah. He is going to explain how. So keep track of that thought as he goes on. Now, Saul mentioned something in the next sentence. And it seems Paul is even trying to explain how to be of a unified mind together. He's speaking to a church. Yes, he wants individuals to apply these things, but he's also talking about a, as a body of believers. Why would Paul be so interested in having them be unified in their thoughts? Let me explain to you why. I'm going to slide over if my mouse will work right. When Jesus was was about to face the cross and we know that he prayed this is what jesus prayed for you and i and there's a significant point that is associated with what paul was trying to say here about being of the same mind jesus prayed this he's praying to the father i have given them the glory that you gave me that they may be one as we are one i in them and you in me so that they may be brought to complete unity. Jesus made this point in his prayer that unity as believers, unity together in our hearts, in our purpose, in our affection, in our support for one another is so very important to him. Listen to what he then said. Watch and look at the screen where it says, then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Jesus is saying here that our unity will be a signal to the world that they will know that you sent me. The unity among believers is supposed to be a key element, a key demonstration to the world that believers truly are worshiping someone who was real, who really came, that God sent Jesus, that Jesus accomplished his purpose. He wanted to disperse it for the disciples to be unified. And then he wanted to make sure that all those who believed after would be unified. This was his prayer. Now, if I go back to look at what Paul was saying here, he's saying much the same thing here. I want you to be of the same love and of, and of one mind. And then he goes on to say how this is going to happen. So he, so Saul made a point of, of uh, this uh, next sentence where he says, you can't be selfish. You can't be selfish or conceited and be unified like Jesus wanted us to be. You've got hum, you to be humble, he says, in humility count others more significant than yourselves think on that please for just a few moments in humility count others as more significant than yourselves their needs are more significant helping them is more significant than what i want putting them first giving deference to others thinking more of well, I don't, uh, someone else, I can, my needs can be taken care of later. I want to make sure this person's needs are taken care of. And also, when I think about selfish ambition or conceit, that's what generally causes people to step on other others, to try and step over others, to try and show that they're better than others. But in humility, humility, let's keep going here. It says, look each let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. That's kind of maybe an amplified way of saying, don't be selfish or conceited. And then he goes this way. Remember, I mentioned something about the mind, the attitude of the mind, the mindset, the, the Paul was making an emphasis here. And here he goes again. Here's the third time this is mentioned in just a few sentences. Have this mind among yourselves. I want you to have this kind of thinking. And here he goes. Which is yours in Christ Jesus. Now listen to what he says about Jesus here. This is almost like Paul's trying to 
described to these Philippian believers, I want you to understand how significant it is that Jesus, God himself, came to live among us. Here's what I want you to understand, Paul says. Even though Jesus was in the form of God, he did not count equality something that he was going to grasp or you might say hold on to. Jesus was with God from the beginning. They were three in one, the Father, Son, and Spirit. Paul refers to and amplifies that in many of his writings very clearly. So if you come across somebody who knocks on your door and says, no, Jesus is just a glorified angel. Jesus was just a, a sub-God who was not the real God. Jesus was a man who became God. Jesus was like, we, we can all be like Jesus and try to ascribe to being a God. Or maybe some religions who say, well, Jesus was his own God and he got one planet and there are other gods like him on other planets. No, it Jesus was God from the beginning. In Hebrews, it tells us Jesus created all things. All things came together through him. All things are held together by him, Jesus. But here it says, even though that is the Jesus we're talking about, he didn't hold on to or demand the equality with God was something that he would not give up. Instead, he emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. Being born as a human being was a tremendously humble step of stepping down and becoming, humbling himself and letting people treat him letting him become a baby, letting people treat him like a child, letting him people treat him as they did later when he was crucified, treat him as a criminal, even though he had done nothing of a sort. He was born in the likeness of men. And then Paul goes on to explain, being for, found in human form, he further not just decided I'm willing to, to go and be with human beings as a human, as a person, but he became, he humbled himself and became obedient to what God the Father described and planned for him to do, even to the point of death on the cross. This is the mindset Paul says you and I need to understand and we need to commit ourselves to. That is the mindset of Jesus. As a result, Jesus, who did not seek earthly glory, it says, but therefore God highly exalted him. It was just like it says in, in um, 1 Peter 5 and also in James. If you humble yourself, you can and let, let God do, humble, you know, uh, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he, God, may exalt you at the proper time. And that's what it says about he, here with Jesus. He exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. So the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. There is a day coming when every, every being, every creature will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. You say, well, I see a lot of people walking around now and they don't care. They don't look at Jesus as Lord. They don't, they, they, they use Jesus' name as a curse word. They use the name of God as a four-letter word to express their disgust. There is a day coming when the name of Jesus is the name that they will acknowledge and they will bow and they will confess that Jesus is Lord. Now, Amen. Uh, we are, you and I are given the, the choice the opportunity to do that now, to do that here while we're living. Now, I want to share with you, though, other places here where Paul talks about this, uh, this attitude and this mindset. And so one of the things that becomes important here, and if you get nothing else from this study tonight, I want you to understand and listen to what Paul is saying about having 
the mind of Christ. Here, here in 1 Corinthians 2, look on your screen, it says the natural person, and by that he's referring to a person who is not born again, who is not a follower of Christ, does not accept the things of the Spirit of God for their folly to him, foolishness. And he's not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. You hear people all the time, the internet, television, entertainers, and they dismiss the name of Jesus. They dismiss Christianity. They dismiss the followers of Jesus. They dismiss anyone who wants to put their faith in that as being foolishness. And it's, it's, it's just a bunch of myths and all these kinds of disparaging things. It says these people are not spiritually discerned. The spiritual person judges all things, but is himself to be judged by no one. For who has understood the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? In other words, tell God what to do. But we, Paul says, we have the mind of Christ. If you have been born again, if God's spirit lives in you, then you have the mind of Christ. That's what Paul was saying in our verses in Philippians tonight. You need to have this mind in you, this attitude in you, these thoughts in you. And so he goes on to tell people like Timothy. He says, Okay, now here, Timothy, here are some very practical things I want you to teach. But these are all things that have to do with the mind of a person who is a follower of Jesus. And he says, flee the evil desires of youth, pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call the Lord out of a pure heart. Don't have anything to do with foolish and stupid arguments because you know they produce quarrels. The Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but be kind to everyone, able to teach, not resentful. Opponents to these instructions must be gently instructed in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of truth, the truth, that they will come to their senses and escape the trap of the devil, who's taken them captive to do his will. Paul is pointing out to here to Timothy and, of course, to the people in Philippi, what we are now facing as believers we're facing a battle for the mind we're facing a battle where we have even every day we're struggling over the things that capture our mind we've got the we've got an enemy satan who wants to take captive thought our thoughts of, of our minds we have the world and its system trying to capture our mind. Advertising certainly does. They're trying to persuade you. They're trying to get you to even have focus on thoughts and needs. You've got to have this, the desire for this. You, you need this pleasure. You need this comfort. You need these things. And the focus is to try and capture your mind and your will, your emotions, your desires, and get you to be like them. Certainly not to point out to them what Jesus said, what Jesus said is right, what God's word says is right, what God has established as the standard of truth. That's what you and I have to battle in our own minds because it is such a battle. The other part that we battle is our own selves, the, 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 the thoughts that we struggle with, thoughts about the mistakes I've made in the past, thoughts about the people that I have to relate to who, who just plain don't like me, who who just want to be contentious with me and who want to just continue to cause frustrations and troubles and 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 family members who are not very you know receptive to me and and what I'm going through or I've gone through all these things are part of the battle of the mind and you and I have to struggle with the battle for our minds and Paul says in Romans 8 I don't have that the verses up here uh, on the screen but he talks in Romans 8. Look it up tonight. Look and read chapter 8 of Romans where he says, the mind of the, that's on the flesh is going to stay and is in, in the death of what the consequences are of the things of our flesh. What we want, what we feel, what we taste, what we touch, what we smell, who we want to you know, be with, all the desires of our flesh and the mind that's set on those things. If you're focused on those things, if you're thinking about those things, if you're dwelling on them, if you're making that the basis for your choices, you're going to continue to spiral down into despair, despondence, depression, and, and, a, and no feeling of hope. But the mind that is set on the spirit is life and peace. What does that mean? That means 
I want to saturate my mind with God's thoughts, with God's word. I want my mind to be like Jesus, Paul said. So if there's nothing else that you remember from our time tonight, I want to go back to this one, one verse that describes what Paul's instructions were. Have this mind in you, which was in Christ. He humbled himself before God. He took a lowly position. He was obedient to what God told him to do, even if it cost his life. You and I have that choice day after day as followers of Jesus to make the choice. I'm going to follow after what God says. I'm going to do things his way. I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to exaggerate, stretch the truth. I'm not going to deceive. I'm not going to chase after things that I know are going to get me into difficult trouble. I'm not going to chase after those things which repeatedly caused me to stumble. I'm going to to, to, to focus my mind on being committed to and being, uh, you know, diligent to. It's a, in, in this battle, I want to diligently win this battle by focusing my, my mind. It starts all in my thoughts. When you get up in the morning, don't listen to your own thoughts. Your own thoughts are going to be filled with your wants, your desires, the, even despairing thoughts, even resentful, regretful thoughts. Instead, Focus your mind, your mind on God's thoughts, on God's word, pulling out your Bible, getting alone with him, thinking about verses of scripture, making your mind conform to your will. All right, let's stop now. And I want to open it up for anybody who'd like to make any comments or questions, anything that we discussed tonight about the book of Philippians. We're going to stop here at this point in, in the second chapter. We'll pick it up again next week. So, any thoughts? Anybody want to share? Go yeah, ahead. Jason. Uh, Jason, um, go ahead. Jose. Uh, I heard you say three things. I heard you mention God, Jesus, and the Spirit. So, it is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Yes, that's yes. how it is, right? Uh huh. Okay, and the reason why I say that because I heard other people like. I don't know, like say 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 it differently, but I do believe personally that it is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You know that is what I just wanted to confirm that. You know, let's say Jason. Yes. That yes. This the the Bible throughout throughout the Scriptures has taught that from the very beginning, God was three persons in one being, and that we. So that we can understand the Bible, God's given us the instructions in the scriptures to understand that the Father and the Son and the Spirit are these three separate persons, and yet they are one in that they are all God. The Bible throughout, if you certainly look at the Old and New Testament together, the Bible refers to God the Father as God, refers to God the Son as God, Jesus, and refers to the Spirit as of as god and even jesus himself when he was commissioning his disciples just before he ascended into heaven he said i want you to go into all the world and make disciples baptizing them in the name of the father and of the son and of the spirit jesus yeah. confirmed that that's that is the god that we worship and he is one god yes the jewish people would profess to you today there's only one God and he is only one. Yes, there is. And the Christians would affirm the same thing. There is only one God and he is one. And yet he yeah. is three persons. Three yeah. persons. And we know, of course, that God the Son became a human and became flesh and that he fulfilled a part of God's purpose as a human. And then he, yeah. became, he ascended into heaven in a, a body that was transformed into a, a, a supernaturally heavenly body, uh -huh. Jesus as, as the Son. And God's Amen. Spirit, it was sent when Jesus left earth, God's Spirit was sent to be in each of us. That's what we, we learned from the scriptures. Okay? Amen. Thank you. Go ahead. Can I can yeah, I say something? Ahead. Yeah, sometimes it just gets a little bit of uh, it gets a little confusing, Jose. But um, 
man, there's a message I love to preach this around uh, Father's Day, somewhere in that, you know, I, I like to preach it on Father's Day, on that, you know, Father's Day. And it's it's like um, the question that I that I always pose to the to the to the to the church, which is the body of Christ is, is it safe to say happy Father's Day, Jesus, you know, is Jesus our father and Jesus is our father. You know, and I and I and I show that I, I I point it out through the scriptures. You know, Jesus, he he's our Father. Um, Jesus, uh, the the Holy Spirit also is is our Father. They're all three, but they're all in one. They're all the same in a sense. You know, they're just manifested and manifested in in different ways. Um, so, but um, now that you bring that up, man, I'm gonna uh, uh, I'm, I, I don't think I ministered on it last year, but I'll. I'll I'll minister it on this year, so don't miss that message on uh, on Father's Day because I really uh, break it down. You know, I really break it down um, it, with 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 the scriptures. You know, uh, uh, with scriptures um, proving proving that fact. But Jesus, he's 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 our Father, and the the, our, the Holy Spirit also. They're all three in one. Um, it's the same thing. The other thing that I wanted to point out in this um, Bible study is that. Um, Man, Jason, this was a good, really good, great, it was a great Bible study, uh, you know, and um, Jason was talking about, oh, you know, being in one in four, one accord, being in unity, you know, um, being in one mind, having that one mind, you know, and um, so, you know, Jesus, he lives in us, the Father lives in us, the Holy Spirit lives in us, and he's full of love, he's full of comfort, he's encouraging, he's gentle, he's forgiving, he's compassion, he has compassion, he has mercy, he has grace, he, you know, um and and we should all we should all have that if the holy spirit lives is in a, it lives in us if the father lives in us if jesus christ lives in us amen that's the way we should be demonstrating these type of um attributes these type of characteristics these type type of things towards um each other you know that grace that mercy amen amen okay amen anybody um, else have a, oh go ahead yes Angelica. Go hi ahead. hi good evening jason hi. i would like to say thank you for the scriptures definitely want to um just expound a little bit on what you shared um i love the breakdown of the mindset that we have you did ask a question what we thought about that first sentence there the first word that came to mind i waited for others um but i saw christ you know that was the whole point um of what you were looking for so i love how you gave um ample opportunity for us to look and see what was something that just stuck out it was christ because that's the whole point of us having that same mindset yeah. um the question for the gentleman um jose ruiz um if you look in romans chapter 8 verse 9 it talks about god the father um christ and then the spirit as well um, which indicates why we are no longer in the flesh because we have the mind of Christ. So I just wanted to clarify that and share. Um, also, good job to all the followers and those who um, followed along. Really good teaching, I would love to say. And um, thank you for having me, and God bless you, folks. Amen. Glad you joined us. Hi. I'd like to say something. Go ahead, Fern. Uh, I like the part about um, we had the mind of Christ and also that Christ humbled himself even into death on the cross for us, so that when um, I feel like raising up and defending myself, you know, or trying to convince somebody of my ideas or whatever, I just say, I have the mind of Christ. I don't have to defend myself. I just humble myself and let this and be willing to yield, like James said, willing to yield, because that's what Jesus did. He didn't. He fed himself when they was questioning him before they took him to the cross. He went to like a, a lamb going to get sheared. He didn't say nothing. And so I'm learning that. I have the mind of Christ. I'm able to do that. Amen. Because the Holy Spirit lives in me. I can do that. I don't have to always be right or first or even last. I don't I can just be humble enough to try to pick up on how I can bring the light to the situation. I love being um, filled up with Christ and remembering that I had the mind of Christ. I could do this. Yeah, I love that. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's a very good way to apply it, especially when you feel like you 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 have to defend yourself. You know what? That's exactly what Jesus is following in the steps of Jesus. 
That's very good. Okay. Did you miss our Bible study last week? Or would you like to listen to other previously recorded studies with topics that will encourage you in your faith and help you to understand the Scriptures even more? Go to our website, redeem2020ministries.org. Click on Bible Study in the menu at the top of the screen, and there you'll find our section where we have listed previously recorded studies.